The student got off the bus and disappeared without a trace, and the next day her body was found in a field. The police spent 39 years searching for the culprit, and only in 2019 did modern technology allow them to discover the truth. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Helen Przezinski. Helen Przezinski was born on April 6, 1958, in Huntington, which was located near New York City. She was the youngest of three children. Her brother and sister were 12 and 9 years old, respectively. The girl grew up in love and care, got along well with her older relatives, and was a positive, bright person. When she was 14, her father received a job offer, and the family had to move to the small town of Hamilton near Boston. There she enrolled in the local school where she developed a passion for singing and sports. At the same time, Helen decided that she wanted to tie her future life with journalism. After high school, she enrolled at Wheaton College, 110 kilometers from her town. It was close enough to visit her family regularly. In addition, the institution offered a truly quality education in journalism. Helen quickly adapted to student life, doing well in school and taking an active part in college life. Eventually, she had an opportunity she was looking forward to. She was to go to an internship at a radio news station located in Denver. Despite the fact that she was more than 3,000 miles away from her college, Helen was excited about the opportunity. In addition, her aunt lived in Denver and agreed to take her in for the internship. With her also went a classmate who studied journalism. In January 1980, Helen, then 21, flew to Denver and began working at a radio station. Every day, she had to take the bus from the office to her home. The trip took about 30 minutes, after which she had to walk several miles. On January 16th, she left the radio station as usual at 6 p.m. and went to the bus stop. The only thing was that she never showed up at home. Her aunt immediately began to worry because Helen had always warned her before if she planned to be somewhere late. The woman waited a few hours, but at half past eleven, she decided to go to the police after all. Investigators had already begun a search immediately, fearing that her disappearance might be connected to a recent string of attacks on women in the area. They combed the area along Helen's route all night but could not find her. In the morning, a woman approached the police. She was driving her car through a suburban area of Denver with her children. At one point, they noticed someone lying in a field near the road. The mother stopped the car, walked closer, and saw the body of a young girl with no signs of life. The police arrived on the scene and immediately identified Helen. Her clothes were partially missing. Her hands were tied behind her back, and all her personal belongings were also missing. Later, medical experts determined that the girl had been stabbed nine times and abused. The death occurred between 8 and 10 p.m. Police were able to find a witness who saw Helen get off the bus at about 5.30. She had several kilometers to walk from the bus stop, and it appears that the perpetrator attacked her at that point. Law enforcement agencies surveyed the area near where the body was found, but they were unable to find almost any clues other than shoe impressions presumably size 44, that led from the road to the body and back. By then, medical examiners had found biological material on the victim's body and clothing that appeared to belong to the killer. Except that in those years, it could not help the investigation because the science of studying DNA was only at an early stage of development. The samples were sent to a laboratory for storage, hoping that they would help identify the perpetrator in the future. Police turned to the public for information, using newspapers and local television. They tried to find witnesses who might have seen Helen that night. Soon they were approached by a woman who at about 10.20 p.m. saw a man near the field where the body was found. He was standing on the side of the road next to a car. Unfortunately, it was dark outside at the time, and the woman could not get a good look at the man. She provided the police with only generalities that could not help them in any way. Then the detectives took a very interesting step. With the consent of the witness, they invited a hypnotist to the station, 
and the woman was able to remember more details on the basis of which it turned out to draw a portrait of this unknown man. It is hard to say whether the hypnosis session really helped the investigation. But the fact remains that at that time, the police had nothing but this drawing, but they could not find a single suspect. And the case froze for years. Six months later, Helen was posthumously awarded her college diploma as a mark of remembrance. In addition, school officials established an alumni award named in her honor. This award was given for the act of participation in college life that had been inherent in Helen throughout her studies. The investigation was not reopened until 1998, 18 years after the murder. By then, technology in the field of DNA research had progressed markedly, and researchers had entered samples of biological material into the FBI database. Unfortunately, no matches were found. This meant that the perpetrator had no previous criminal convictions, at least not since they began taking DNA samples from convicts. Fifteen more years passed. And in 2013, the local police department created a unit to handle unsolved cases. They reopened the investigation into Helen's murder, but no new leads could be found. A DNA sample from the victim's body never showed up in the FBI database. This meant that the girl's killer had not come to the attention of the police for other possible crimes this time. Throughout all these years, Helen's relatives and police were not the only ones trying to find the truth. The girl's high school friends, with whom she was in the choir, took an active part in the investigation. Decades after her murder, they continued to press detectives to review the case regularly. They also gave interviews to get the story out to the public and distributed flyers about Helen's murder along her bus route. In 2017, the case was reopened again. And this time, the detectives had much more to go on. By this point, forensics had begun to make extensive use of genetic genealogy, by which the perpetrator's identity could be deduced through his relatives. Of course, this was a very complicated and time-consuming process. Moreover, this method worked only in the case if the relatives of the DNA processor were in publicly available genetic databases. There are several of these, and they're mostly used to search for family members. In 2018, police turned over available DNA samples to the Parabon lab, which had already helped solve hundreds of similar cases. Experts had about 3,000 matches to examine, including even the most distant relatives of the alleged killer. Then they had to sift out those who didn't fit the age or who couldn't commit the crime for other reasons. Ultimately, the experts determined that the person with the DNA was very likely the son of a woman named June Estes, who was no longer alive at the time. The problem was that she had four sons, but the lab was only able to identify two of them. They were 10 and 11 years old at the time of the murder, so they were ruled out right away. The search for the other two sons dragged on and experts began to explore other options. Another year passed before something unexpected happened. A woman named Jessie entered her DNA sample into a public database, which was the primary tool for finding criminals. Experts at Parabon immediately saw that Jessie was a fairly close relative of Helen's killer and contacted her. In a more detailed DNA examination, the expert determined that Jessie's third cousin was the killer. Detectives asked the woman for information about her family to finally identify the suspect. Luckily, Jessie was into podcasts about various crimes like Helen's murder. It was for this reason that she put her information into the open database. After all, genetic genealogy can be used to find a person through even the most distant relatives, and Jessie knew she could help solve a case with her decision. However, she could not have imagined that this would happen immediately after uploading her data into the database. The woman began collecting information about her family tree and asked both of her parents to enter their DNA into the database. Through this, experts at Parbon determined that the killer was related to Jesse on her father's side. Unfortunately, the search for an answer would drag on for several more months. The detectives and Jesse's family worked together to get closer to the owner of the DNA from the murder scene. And soon, it finally happened. The cops were able to reach a relative of June Estes, 
and he gave new details about her older sons. It turned out that the woman suffered from mental problems, and after her next breakdown, her father took the boys and took them to another town. Their names were William and Curtis, and the detectives were to find out which one of them was the killer. The answer was not long in coming. The cops immediately discovered that William had been incarcerated multiple times, and his DNA sample was entered into the FBI database in 2010. Given that the sample from Helen's body had been run through that database repeatedly since then, William was not the killer. The downside of this database is that it only shows a full match, not a partial match, even when brothers are involved. As a result, 39 years after the murder, the police had a prime suspect, Curtis White, who also used the last name Clanton. It turned out that this man also had a rich criminal history under his belt. When he was 18 years old, he knocked on a woman's door and asked to use her phone. Once inside, he grabbed a knife and abused the victim before fleeing. He was quickly caught and imprisoned for 30 years, except he was released after four years. He was released early because he was defended by an employee of a Christian institution for troubled teens, where Curtis had been before his majority for stealing a car. This man said he would be willing to house the offender in his home and find him a job. It's hard to imagine how you can bring a convicted felon into your home with your wife and five children, but this man asked the court to release Curtis on those terms. Upon his release, Curtis moved in and took a job as a gardener. At the time of Helen's murder, he was living in that area. He later moved to Florida, where the detectives went in 2019. Curtis was 62 years old at the time, working as a trucker. Before charging him with Helen's murder, investigators wanted more hard evidence. They monitored the man for about a week in an attempt to secretly obtain a sample of his DNA. For this, they removed a milk carton from his trash can and sent it to the lab experts found someone's DNA on it, but there was too little to analyze. On November 30th, detectives followed him to a bar where the suspect drank several bottles of beer from the same glass. As soon as he left, that glass was seized and shipped to a lab in Colorado. It took almost a month to transport and examine, but eventually, the detectives had the long-awaited result in their hands. The sample from the victim's body matched Curtis's DNA exactly. He was arrested on December 11th and charged with Helen's murder. The man denied any involvement in the case, so the prosecutor was preparing to take the case to court, and the man himself was extradited to Colorado. And here, something unexpected happened. On the way there, he began to gradually confess to what he had done. The detectives who accompanied him listened to all the details of the crime. Curtis said he was driving down the street and noticed a lonely girl getting off the bus. Pulling out a knife, he forced her into his car for the purpose of committing acts of violence. He then drove her out of town, abused her, and killed her. As a result, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Considering that he will be 82 years old by then, the perpetrator may well not live to see that day. Unfortunately, most of Helen's own relatives did not wait for the killer to be punished either. Her parents and older brother had passed away many years before, and only her older sister survived. Nearly 40 years later, the elderly woman received a call from the police station, finally informing her that the case had been solved. There remains one more creepy moment in this whole story. As you may recall, at the time of Helen's murder, there were repeated incidents of abuse of women in Denver, and these crimes had a common M.O. Now detectives think Curtis was behind them, but they can no longer prove it. Share your opinion on this story in the comments. This monstrous story, which took place in 2005, shocked the whole of Britain with its cruelty. A young woman who had built a successful modeling career by the time she was 18 was found 10 meters from the door of her own home. The police had spent vast resources searching for the culprit, and only a tiny DNA sample helped them in the case. Sally Ann Bowman was born on September 11, 1987, in London. She grew up in a large family with three older sisters. Her parents, Linda and Paul, later divorced, but the girl continued to maintain a good relationship with her father. 
Sally was a cheerful and friendly girl with a big heart. At the same time, she was also very responsible. Already in her teens, she got a job and came to live in rented housing. The girl did not want to depend on her parents financially, but continued to see her family regularly. Later, Sally enrolled at the prestigious London School of Performing Arts and Technology Brit. This institution is known for such alumni as actor Tom Howadell and Amy Winehouse. Sadly dreamed of working as a model, and the fact that she was able to enroll at this school was a big step towards her cherished goal. Graduating in 2004, she spent some time working as a hairstylist and model. But in January 2005, she landed a job with a London-based model agency, Pulse Model Management. From the first months, Sally has achieved impressive success in the new work. She became the face of the popular watch brand Swatch and took part in prestigious fashion shows. As a result, by the age of 18, she had already managed to build a successful career. On Saturday, September 24, 2005, Sally went to visit her mother and spent most of the day at her home. Later, her older sister, Nicole, called her and invited her to her best friend's birthday party. Sally agreed and left her mother's house around 6 p.m., saying she loved her. At 10 p.m., the young woman met her sister and her friends at the Lloyd's Bar establishment in downtown Croydon. Surveillance footage at the bar showed Sally having a great time. The company was partying, socializing, and dancing. At about 1 a.m., Sally left the bar with her sister. They walked to her house, but the young woman didn't stay there long. On the way, she called her ex-boyfriend Louis Sportster and arranged to meet him in downtown Croydon. At about 2.30 a.m., she got in a cab and drove to the designated location. During the meeting, there was an argument between them. They had broken up only a few weeks earlier over mutual grievances and had been trying unsuccessfully to resolve the situation ever since. Lewis decided to give her a ride home on Blenheim Crescent, and they continued to argue the entire way. The couple worked out the relationship until about 4.15 a.m., at which point, Sally got out of the car and headed home. At about the same time, Neighbors were awakened by an unexplained noise that changed to screaming. People ran to the windows, but there was nothing suspicious going on outside. Five minutes later, they only saw an unknown man walking down the street. At about 6.30 a.m., one of the neighbors came out of the house and noticed something strange. From behind a nearby construction container, something looked out that he first mistook for the legs of a mannequin. But as soon as he came closer... A frightening sight awaited him. There lay the half-naked body of a dead woman. She turned out to be Sally Bowman. The police quickly arrived on the scene and sealed off the area. They were unable to find the murder weapon, but experts later found DNA on the woman's body from an unknown man. They also discovered that Sally had been stabbed at least seven times with a sharp object and had been abused. The unknown maniac had even left several bite marks on her body. Sally's family was shattered by this news. When her mother heard a knock on the door this morning, she thought it was Sally coming home. But there were police officers on the doorstep who informed her of her daughter's murder. Hours later, Sally's mother and sister had to go to the morgue to be identified. They hoped to the last that it was all one big mistake and that Sally was really alive. It wasn't until they saw her body that they realized it was really her. Meanwhile, the police launched an investigation, and the first thing they did was run a DNA sample from the woman's body through the databases, but that didn't help them identify the perpetrator. There were also no cameras in that area, which only made the job more difficult. Investigators determined that Sally was killed just 10 feet from the door of her home. Her path from her car to the building was also very short. Her attacker must have attacked her almost immediately after she left the car. The first thing the police suspected was her ex-boyfriend, Lewis. He was the last person to see Sally, and her murder occurred almost immediately after she got out of the car. Investigators also found out that the couple had often quarreled in the past. Several times it even went as far as calling the police, 
but no charges were ever filed. On the same day, the police tracked him down and arrested him. When questioned, he stated that he didn't even know Sally was dead until the detectives themselves told him about it. He admitted that there had indeed been an altercation between them that night but denied any involvement in the murder. According to his version, as soon as Sally got out of the car, he drove away. The investigators were in no hurry to take the guy's word for it because things looked really not in his favor. He spent four days in custody while detectives waited for the results of a DNA test. Eventually, it was discovered that his DNA did not match the sample, and Lewis was released. At the same time, experts discovered another interesting detail. The DNA sample found on Sally's body appeared in a criminal case four years ago. In 2001, a woman called from a phone booth located in the parking lot of a convenience store. At some point, a man entered the booth, stripped naked, and committed lewd acts. He did not touch the woman and fled but left his DNA on the floor of the booth. The victim went to the police, and a sample of the pervert's DNA was attached to the case. However, they were never able to find the perpetrator. All of this happened not too far from where Sally was killed, two and a half kilometers away. The police realized that they were dealing with a serial pervert who had been on the loose for years. The only question was how many women had suffered at the hands of this maniac, and when he would strike next? Detectives had to find him before he ruined someone else's life. It soon became clear that the police's fears were not in vain. Just an hour before Sally's murder, a woman had been attacked on a nearby street. She was walking home, talking on her cell phone. At some point, a man approached her, apologized, and immediately struck her. The woman screamed and dropped her phone. But what happened next was something the attacker clearly did not expect. A taxi cab appeared on the road, and that frightened him away. He grabbed the victim's phone and fled. One creepy thing worth noting here, the person on the other end of the line, the woman, was still on the line and heard everything. Even after the perpetrator took the phone and disappeared from the victim's sight, her cries for help did not become any quieter. That meant he was hiding quietly nearby. Perhaps he hoped that the cab driver would drive by, and the victim would be at his disposal again. Fortunately, the driver heard the screams and stopped. He put the woman in the car and took her to the hospital. There she called the police and told them what had happened. According to her description, the attacker was a white male, 25 to 30 years old, about 180 centimeters tall with short dark hair. On the basis of this data, the police compiled a sketch which was published in the media. Alas, a large number of men fell under such a vague description. So detectives received hundreds of calls from local residents. They all said that the sketch looked like someone they knew or had seen a similar man somewhere. Each such call was checked by the police, but it yielded no results. When they realized they would not be able to find the maniac from the sketch, the investigators decided to go another way. The only lead they had was a DNA sample found on the victim's body. In addition, the detectives were sure that the perpetrator lived in the area. This was evidenced by the fact that he had also attacked a woman in a phone booth on a nearby street. As a result, the decision was made to DNA screen the entire neighborhood. Police officers were to go to every apartment and house, ask questions, and ask residents to volunteer their DNA samples. Of course, the detectives did not expect the perpetrator to give them his DNA, but it was enough to get a sample from his relatives to get them closer to catching the culprit. For example, the man may have lived with parents who are unaware of his atrocities and would willingly provide his DNA to the police. For the next six months, police officers went to more than 6,000 addresses, and many area residents provided their DNA samples, but the entire operation came to nothing. Despite law enforcement's efforts, experts at the lab found no matches with the perpetrator's sample. All the while, the people of Croydon were in fear, and police rounds only increased the anxiety. They all knew there was a maniac on their streets. Women were afraid to walk at night, parents would not let their children go out. As a result, 
the police had to go back to the sketch since there was nothing else to work with. They contacted the woman who had been attacked by the maniac on the day of Sally's murder, as well as the victim from the phone booth. They were asked to redescribe the perpetrator's appearance, and based on this testimony, the detectives compiled an adjusted version of the sketch. The police showed it at a press conference and for the first time revealed some details of the crimes committed, which up to that point had been kept secret. This was done in the expectation that the citizens of Freud would realize how dangerous maniacs walk freely on their streets and would be more careful. Alas, all this also yielded no results. The updated sketch was not much different from the previous one and was too generalized. Thousands of men who lived in the area fit it. But what happened next was something no one expected. A completely random breakthrough in the case. A man was sitting in a bar watching soccer, and after drinking heavily, he began to argue with one of the patrons, and soon, their conflict turned into a scuffle on the street. Unfortunately for him, a police officer walked by as he pushed his opponent to the ground. He apprehended the attacker and took him to the police station. There, something strange began. The instigator of the conflict, Mark Dixie, 35, went into a real panic and almost cried. This was very illogical behavior since he had been arrested for a misdemeanor. Most likely, no charges would have been filed by his opponent at all, and the man was free to go home. The police found him very suspicious but they soon had to release him on bail. Before that, they conducted the standard procedure for all detainees, taking his fingerprints and a DNA sample. Twelve days passed, and the detectives received a call from the lab. The experts made an unexpected announcement. Mark Dixie's DNA was a perfect match to the sample found on Sally's body. Investigators realized they had a dangerous maniac on their hands, but they let him go. In any case, the law would not allow them to hold him any longer, and now the police had to rearrest the perpetrator. Unfortunately for them, Dixie escaped to Amsterdam as soon as he was released. The British authorities put out a search warrant for him, but the man successfully escaped. This went on for three months until something strange happened. The criminal quarreled with the owner of the apartment he was renting in Amsterdam and returned back to England. Moreover, he got a job at his previous place of work, making the work of the police much easier. On June 28, 2006, almost a year after the murder, he was finally arrested and this time charged with a whole series of serious crimes. After examining his background, police found that Mark had a very rich criminal history. He committed his first crime in 1986 when he was 16 years old. He attacked a woman with a knife, robbed her, and committed depraved acts. He was sentenced to only six months in prison because of his age. Each subsequent year, Mark was put on trial again for robbery and molestation. And in 1990, he was arrested for assaulting a police officer. Unfortunately, all of these times, the court system was favorable to him. The man received little time and continued to commit crimes. In 1993, he moved to Australia where he picked up where he left off. Five years later, he broke into a young woman's home, robbed and abused her. He was then arrested for exhibitionism in a park and deported from the country in 1999. Unfortunately, in those years, the police were not yet collecting DNA samples from criminals. So Dixie's DNA from the murdered woman's body showed no matches in existing databases. The police had a lot of work to do before taking the case to court. They discovered that the night Sally was killed, Dixie was celebrating his birthday at a bar with friends on Brighton Road, a few hundred yards from her home. He argued with his girlfriend over the phone and spent the rest of the evening abusing alcohol and illegal substances. He withdrew into himself and had little contact with anyone. After the bar closed, Mark and his two girlfriends went to a house nearby waiting for them to fall asleep. The man took a knife and went outside. According to the investigation, he was the one who attacked the woman who was saved from death by a cab driver. Fearing that she would call the police, Mark left for another street. 
Unfortunately, that's when Sally Bowman got out of the car and headed for her door. He attacked her, abused her, and fled. Apparently, it was him walking down the street that the neighbors saw from their windows at night. After killing Sally, he went back to his apartment and quietly went to bed. Mark Dixie's trial began on February 5, 2008. He refused to admit his guilt, instead making up a really ridiculous story. According to his version, he was just walking down the street and saw Sally laying on the ground. He took advantage of the situation, abused her and left, and someone else killed the woman. Dixie claimed that he allegedly did not know the woman was dead. During the trial, a woman from Australia was also found who Dixie attacked in 1998. He abused her, stabbing her seven times, but never punished her. The jury unanimously found Dixie guilty of Sally's murder, despite his ridiculous history. As a result, the court sentenced him to life in prison with a minimum sentence of 34 years. After that, he was transferred from one prison to another several times. Each time his cellmates bullied him and tried to kill him. All this time, Mark continued to deny his involvement in the murder, and it wasn't until 2015, ten years later, that he confessed. This did not make his situation any worse, but the police were able to prove his involvement in the other crimes. In 2017, it turned out that an innocent Dutch citizen had served 12 years in prison for an attack on three women in Spain, which was in fact committed by Mark Dixie. In addition, the perpetrator also voluntarily confessed to another assault which he committed when he was 16 years old. Dixie attacked a woman in a parking lot, abused her, stole her credit cards, and set her car on fire. That same evening, he found out her home phone number, called her and began taunting the victim. The woman then moved to live in the countryside because she could not cope with her trauma. That same year, Dixie was found guilty of assaulting two women in Croydon, for each of which he received another life sentence. 2017 was marked by another unpleasant event. Sally's family had to exhume her remains because unknown vandals kept desecrating her grave. The family decided to cremate her and leave her ashes at home. After all of this ordeal, Sally's mother is a strong advocate for a national DNA database. In her opinion, if the government collected DNA samples of all British residents, such crimes would be solved in 24 hours instead of 9 months. In addition, the woman was certain that if the perpetrator had not left his DNA at the scene, Sally's ex-boyfriend would have gone to prison for life for a murder he did not commit. The detective leading the investigation in Sally's murder supported the idea of a DNA database, but the government rejected it. In their view, forced DNA collection would violate basic human rights. This issue is very controversial. On one hand, such a database would really help solve such crimes in a matter of hours. In addition, some criminals would not dare to commit atrocities at all, knowing that they could be identified very quickly. On the other hand, not every criminal leaves their DNA behind. Also, leaking or misusing information from such a database could really hurt law-abiding people. Do you think such databases are necessary? Share your opinion in the comments, and don't forget to rate the clip if you liked it. An 11-year-old girl walked out of school and disappeared without a trace. For years, this case has been one of the most confusing and creepy in California, with many unexpected twists and turns and strange facts. It took 45 years to finally uncover the truth, but the story didn't end there either. In this video, we'll tell you what happened to Linda O'Keefe and why this investigation has caught the attention of millions of people around the world. Linda O'Keefe was born on May 24, 1962, in Newport Beach, California, USA. She grew up in a large and close-knit family. Her father was a machinist, and her mother was a seamstress. Linda had two sisters, an older sister and a younger sister. Linda was fond of drawing, played the piano, and loved nature and animals very much. On warm summer days, she did not miss any opportunity to go out to the beach, which was only 800 meters from her home. The girl was also a Girl Scout and attended summer school. 
In July 1973, when Linda was 11, she went there almost every day. Usually, she rode her bicycle to school, but on the morning of July 6th, a piano teacher who lived a few houses away from the O'Keefe family agreed to give her a ride. After class ended at about 1.30, Linda used the school phone to call her mother. She asked to be picked up because she was without her bicycle that day. But the woman was working at home at the time and didn't want to be distracted, so she told her daughter to walk. Even though it was only a little over two kilometers from school to home, Linda didn't want to walk. After talking to her mother, she even cried, and the school secretary thought about giving her a ride home. But the woman needed to go the other way, so she gave up the idea. Linda came out of the school, sat outside the building for a while, and headed toward home. Her route should have taken no more than half an hour, but the girl was clearly delayed. At first, her mother did not think much of it. She thought Linda had met her friends and gone for a walk. But with each passing hour, she became more and more worried. By 6 p.m., her mother decided to call everyone she knew whose children lived nearby and might have gone out with her daughter, but none of them had seen Linda that day. When her father returned from work, the family decided to go looking. They drove all over the neighborhood, including the route Linda was supposed to take back from school. At that point, the parents assumed the girl had resented her mother for refusing to pick her up and was deliberately not going home. But when they still could not find her and it began to get dark outside, they decided to go to the police. Officers took a missing girl report and began their search. Meanwhile, her father and older sister went out again to comb the neighborhood in two cars, while her mother stayed home calling dozens of people who at least with the slightest chance could have seen Linda. The search continued throughout the night. Police searched the streets and parks using search dogs and helicopters, but it was inconclusive. By morning, the police department had dispatched more officers to join the surge, and local newspapers were already reporting on the massive operation involving the disappearance of the 11-year-old girl. At about 10.30 a.m., a bicyclist and her friend and son were riding through a park that was nine kilometers from Linda's house. They headed there to observe the local fauna for the botanical circle. Father and child dismounted and headed toward the ditches to see frogs, but something else awaited them there. Noticing something light in the grass, the man walked closer and saw there a human body partially covered by water. In the morning paper, he had read about the disappearance of a girl who had been searched for all night by the police, so he immediately thought that the body belonged to her. In the next few minutes, the man and his friends ran out of the park got into their cars and rushed to find the nearest payphone to report their find. On the way, they encountered an officer who had been part of the search for Linda. Upon hearing their story, the police officer reported it and headed toward the location. The investigators instantly realized that the deceased was Linda O'Keefe. She was wearing the same clothes the girl left for school, and her backpack was lying next to her. This, as well as the white dress worn by the girl, had been made for her by her mother. She was not wearing shoes. However, they were never found near the body. Detectives proceeded to examine the crime scene. They found tire tracks on the ground near where the body was found but no other clues. Medical examiners determined that strangulation was the cause of death. They determined that the death occurred between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. Investigators understood that Linda had most likely been abducted shortly after she left school, which meant that the perpetrator had held her somewhere for about 12 hours. The victim was also abused, and experts found traces of DNA on her body. They were given to the laboratory for safekeeping since DNA analysis had not yet been performed in those years. With no serious leads on hand, the detective set about looking for witnesses. They interviewed all of Linda's friends, school employees, and residents of the streets where the girl was supposed to walk home. Soon it bore fruit. On her way home from school, the girl was seen by her friend who noticed something strange. Linda was walking along the road, and at some point, a turquoise van approached her. He slowed down and continued to drive next to the girl. 
But her friend did not see further events because Linda and the van disappeared from her field of vision. Almost immediately, police were able to find two more witnesses. The 19-year-old girl and her mother were driving a car about a hundred yards from Linda's school. At one point, they noticed the girl talking to the driver of the turquoise van who had stopped next to her. It was about 1.15 p.m. The witnesses lived near the O'Keefe family and were well acquainted with them, so they were very surprised that Linda was talking to some adult male on the street and decided to watch what was going on. The passenger door of the van was open, and Linda was standing right in front of it. Apparently, she was talking to the driver, and at some point, the girl got into the car. Immediately afterward, the van drove away, and the witnesses decided not to pay much attention to it. They thought that Linda had been picked up by a relative or acquaintance because they were sure that the girl would not get into a car with a stranger. After questioning the girl and her mother, investigators got a rough description of the driver. He was a white man between the ages of 24 and 30, with blonde curly hair and an elongated face. Unfortunately, the women could not remember the license plate number or even the make of the car. Despite this, the story of the two women was the only solid lead in the case. So investigators put together an APB on the suspect and his car. Based on the words of these witnesses, they were sent out all over California, but it was fruitless. The detective spoke with the woman a few more times, hoping they might be able to recall some additional details. At one point, they were even offered a hypnosis session, and they agreed. It only partially worked. The witnesses recalled a few additional facts about the suspect's car, but they were all too insignificant to help find the killer. Soon, the police were able to find another witness. A woman who lived near where Linda's body was found heard a woman screaming at about 10.30 p.m. She thought she heard someone yell, Stop hurting me! But that voice cut off abruptly. Given that the girl died around the same time, the witness could have heard it. The detectives then received another interesting tip. On the morning Linda's body was discovered, the artist was painting a picture in that very park. Noticing dozens of police cars, he began to observe what was going on and realized that something serious had happened. At one point, he saw something that struck him as odd. Besides the police, there was a young man in the park watching from the bushes. He was standing quite close to him, and the artist decided to ask him what was going on. The young man looked extremely worried and said that the police had found the girl's body, except that the man and the artist were standing far enough away from where the body was found and could not see any details. The detectives had a logical question as to how the man knew that it was the girl's body they had found. The artist described the man as a thin white male between 18 and 24 years old, about 180 centimeters tall with blonde hair and sideburns. This was close enough to what the two witnesses told police when describing the appearance of the van driver. As a result, investigators concluded that this man was the killer. He had decided to watch the police that morning. Although the police had a fairly detailed description of the killer's appearance, Finding him in the big city was quite problematic. Two days later, however, something unexpected happened. Peter Wooten, 18, came to them and confessed to the murder. The young man lived near the O.K. family and was in the same class as the victim's older sister, Cindy. The news instantly spread through the town, shocking the residents. Police officers who did not expect such a turn of events questioned the boy for seven hours and also searched his parents' home where he lived. After that, he was formally charged with murder. Three days later, another unexpected twist awaited everyone. Investigators announced that Peter had been cleared of all charges and released. According to them, there were too many inaccuracies in the young man's confession and the only coincidences in his story intersected with information that had appeared in the newspapers. Otherwise, he gave investigators knowingly false testimony which contradicted the real evidence. Lastly, the two witnesses who had seen Linda with the van driver stated with absolute certainty that it was not Peter. They were both acquainted with the young man because they lived near him, so the women would immediately recognize him. As a result, 
The police concluded that the young man was simply trying to draw attention to himself by confessing to someone else's crime. Maybe the guy had some kind of mental problems, but he had nothing to do with the murder. After that, the detectives weren't left with a single solid lead. They kept looking for the van and its driver, combing the entire town. Even Linda's classmates participated in the search, despite protests from the police. Kids rode their bikes through the streets trying to find that same turquoise van. But all of that yielded no results. In the first month of the investigation, police questioned 175 people, combed every millimeter of the path from school to home, and asked the public for help. A few weeks later, they decided to release a rough scan of the van's driver, but that also yielded no results. Initially, detectives were reluctant to do so because they feared the man might flee town, but every day they had to use more and more tools to solve the case. Two months later, the police had a new lead. Another girl had been abused in the same neighborhood. An unidentified man had dragged her into his van, taken her to a deserted place, and after what he had done, let her go. Investigators immediately speculated that Linda's killer might be behind the crime, but there were inconsistencies. The assailant drove a white van, and the description of his appearance did not match the data provided by the witnesses in Linda's case. Soon, the detectives were able to get a lead on the suspect. It turned out to be a 32-year-old trucker, and his guilt was proven. Witnesses said that he did not look at all like the man Linda was talking to, and the investigators concluded that this man had nothing to do with her murder. Since then, no significant evidence has emerged in the case, though detectives continue to work on it over the ensuing years. In 2001, 28 years after the murder, police sent DNA samples from Linda's body to a lab so they could extract a profile of the killer's DNA. They succeeded, but the man was not in the FBI database. This indicated that the killer had not been prosecuted in other criminal cases, or it was before the time when they started taking DNA from criminals. A few years later, experts tried to find his next of kin in that database, but failed again. However, in those years, it was almost impossible to do something like that because the tools of DNA analysis were far from what we have today. A breakthrough in this field of forensics around the middle of 2010, and the police had a new ability to find suspects. Investigators in Linda's case weren't left out either. And in 2018, they turned to a private lab called Parabond. Detectives received from them a portrait of a man based on the DNA of Linda's killer. This innovative technology called DNA phenotyping allows you to know different traits of a person's appearance with just a sample of their DNA. Specialists compiled two portraits at once showing what the perpetrator might have looked like at the age of 20 and 60. Surprisingly, this portrait was very close to the accounts of witnesses who saw the suspect alive 45 years ago. Usually in cases like this, police publish portraits in the media to draw public attention and reach out to those who may have known the man. But investigators in Linda's case did something no one had tried before them. On July 6, 2018, exactly 45 years after the murder, they posted a series of messages on Twitter on behalf of the victim herself. This series of 68 messages described the last day of Linda's life. The detectives presented this information as if she herself were telling the world what happened to her on July 6, 1973. The narrative began in the morning with Linda recounting her day at school, her resentment at her mother for not picking her up in the car, and the girl's journey home on foot. All of the facts from these messages were carefully selected by detectives to paint the most accurate picture possible of the day. The series of tweets ends with the fact that the search for her killer has so far been unsuccessful. At which point, the police have published a portrait of the perpetrator on behalf of the girl. Now, 45 years later, I can speak again, and there is something important I have to tell you. There is a new lead in my case a face obtained thanks to the DNA of the killer, which he left behind. This technology didn't exist in 1973, but now it can change everything. This approach instantly brought Linda's case to the attention of a huge number of people around the world. 
Police officers had shared information on old unsolved cases on social media before, but a narrative from the victim herself was something new. The portrait of the killer himself was useless. It could only help solve the case if someone recognized the person and told the police, so the investigators needed to draw as much attention to these pictures as possible. And they did a great job. In total, more than 7 million people saw the series of tweets. The police received many tips and possible identities of the perpetrator, and detectives spent several months checking them out, but they were never able to find a suitable suspect. In spite of this, they were not going to give up, especially after millions of people were interested in Linda's case. The investigators again turned to Perry Bond, and this time, they asked them to try to find the killer's relatives through his DNA. Something similar forensic scientists had already tried to do in the early 2000s, but back then, the necessary tools simply didn't exist. Almost 20 years later, the situation has changed. Parabon's experts successfully found people related to the owner of the DNA. With this information, investigators could find the perpetrator. Work on finding Linda's killer began in August 2018. It took experts almost six months to get the first results. Using private DNA databases, they were able to find the killer's third cousin. For detectives, that effectively meant they were one step away from solving the case. All they had to do was research the man's family tree and come up with a suspect, but the experts at Parban kept digging deeper. And soon, they had an unexpected discovery. They found the killer's own DNA in one of the private databases. He had voluntarily uploaded his sample to a database that allows them to search for lost or distant relatives. As it turned out later, someone in his family had given the man the special genetic kit he needed to get into the database. Forty-five years later, police finally had a name of the killer. James Allen Neal. The man who was 72 at the time lived in another state and in January 2019, detectives went to see him. Before they could arrest the suspect, they needed to get a sample of his DNA because a private database wouldn't have the weight the court needed. On January 29th, police set up surveillance on Neil's house and arranged with a garbage service to hand them anything the suspect threw out. After obtaining several items from which experts could take a sample of his DNA, Investigators sent them to the lab and then continued to monitor James for the next three days. Unfortunately, Forensic was unable to get a sample of the man's DNA. So the detectives needed to find something else. They soon had that opportunity. They observed the suspect as he sat in his car in the parking lot smoking. He then threw the cigarette butt on the pavement and drove away. And the police immediately picked up the evidence. This time... Experts were able to extract a DNA sample, and it matched the DNA of the killer found on Linda's body exactly. This meant that it was James Neal, who was the very perpetrator they had been searching for almost half a century. A few days later, detectives organized a press conference at which they finally announced the arrest of the suspect. James Neal was born in 1946 in Chicago, after which his family moved to California. Parents often beat and humiliated him and subjected him to violence, which caused him to behave aggressively from an early age. As a teenager, he committed various petty offenses, including breaking into other people's houses. After that, he dropped out of school and tried to get a job, but he never stayed in one place for more than a few months. It turned out that the man had an extensive criminal history. He was arrested more than 12 times for crimes of varying severity, theft, car theft, robbery, but almost every time he got off with minimal punishment and then went back to his old ways. At the age of 25, James married for the first time and the couple settled in the suburbs of Los Angeles. Their home was a half-hour drive from the city where Linda lived and two years after moving in, he killed her. James' wife was pregnant at the time and the perpetrator himself was on probation for less serious crimes in another state. After that, he was cited several more times for theft and counterfeiting bank checks. And he also spent a short stint in prison for violating the terms of his probation. Upon his release from prison, 
James was caught by the police three more times for traffic violations. He divorced his first wife with whom they had two daughters. He lived in different states for a while, but then returned to Colorado and married another woman in 1997. She had a child from her first marriage, and soon, she and James had a daughter. After examining his background in more detail, detectives found that the man may have been involved in dozens of cases of child abuse, but he was never held accountable for what he had done. In 1995, and in 2004, Neil kidnapped two girls by driving up to them in his car. He abused them, and then released them. In both cases, he was never proven guilty, so James remained free. Police later suspected him of at least five more similar episodes in which an unknown man in a car abducted girls from the street. In 2010, a girl who went to the same church as James complained about him. She admitted that the man who was 63 years old at the time had been molesting her for months. In all, the victim reported several similar episodes, and Neil confessed. The only thing that happened next was something incomprehensible. The case was somehow hushed up. The victim recanted her accusations and the men went unpunished. James returned to his usual life, and for the next nine years, he was not in the sight of police until he was arrested for Linda's murder. When questioned, the man denied any involvement and said he had never kidnapped the girls. When shown a photo of Linda, he said he had never seen her with the man adding that she looked like one of his daughters. Given that the suspect's DNA was clearly on the victim's body, the court should have found him guilty anyway. Nevertheless, investigators tried to get as much evidence as they could. They wanted to find out if James had a turquoise van but could not find a single confirmation of that fact. However, this was quickly explained. At the time of Linda's murder, he was a worker in an apartment complex and had access to the service van. During the search of his home, investigators found several hard drives containing illegal materials. Similar photos and videos were also found on his smartphone. Something interesting was also found on his computer. It turned out that James had studied the history of violent criminals who had been caught through DNA analysis. Apparently, he was well aware that it was DNA that could help the police link him to various atrocities. Another surprising discovery awaited the detectives after James was examined before moving into his cell. He had a tattoo of Linda's name on his wrist. Investigators thought he had left a reminder of his victim that way. However, it turned out to be an eerie coincidence. James had gotten the tattoo long before the murder, and the police were able to confirm it. The trial was supposed to start a year after the arrest in February 2020, but it was postponed because of the pandemic. James continued to insist his innocence, but detectives no longer doubted that he had killed Linda. However, the case never came to trial. In May, James was admitted to the hospital where he died two days later of lung cancer. He did not know about his illness before his arrest, and when it was discovered, it was too late to begin treatment. Thus, the half-century-old case was finally put to rest. Detectives still believe that James may have had many more victims, and they intend to keep investigating in that direction. Linda's parents passed away long before the police found the perpetrator. Her mother blamed herself for what happened throughout her life as she refused to pick up the girl from school. Linda's sisters thanked the investigators for not giving up on the case and getting to the bottom of it. Their only regret was that their parents had not lived to see the day. Share your opinion on this story in the comments. A 15-year-old girl disappeared from her bedroom under mysterious circumstances. Police, the FBI, and hundreds of volunteers searched for her. Diving into the case, detectives uncovered many eerie facts and eventually solved this disturbing case. In this video, we tell you what happened to Riley Crossman and why the public was outraged when they learned the bitter truth. Riley Crossman was born on December 22, 2003, in the small American town of Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her parents divorced when she was young, and the girl moved with her mother and younger sister to Berkeley Springs a town 40 kilometers from Martinsburg. 
After a while, her mother began dating another man, and they had two more children. However, Riley maintained a close relationship with her father and regularly went to visit him. The girl attended Berkeley Springs High School and took dance and singing lessons. She also had a boyfriend named Hayden Lacey. According to her parents, there was a great relationship between them. Riley was happy. She and her boyfriend even had a joint Instagram account where they posted pictures together. Her mom, Chantel Oakley, worked two jobs. On May 7, 2019, she took off early from her morning shift because she wasn't feeling well. When she arrived home, she texted Riley that she was going to sleep in before her evening shift and asked her to wake her up when the girl returned from school. Riley came home at about 3.30 p.m., woke up her mother, and went to her room. Chantel's roommate's mother was also in the house with her that day, effectively replacing her grandmother and looking after the younger children. Chantel returned from work at about 10 p.m. As she walked past her daughter's room, she saw that her door was closed, but the light was on behind her. Her mother thought Riley was getting ready for bed and went to bed herself almost immediately. She was still not feeling well and wanted to get a good night's sleep before her morning shift. The next day at about 7.15 a.m., Chantel peeked into her daughter's room before she left for work, but Riley wasn't there. She didn't see anything suspicious about that, though. School started at 7.45, and the girl could have gone there already. Riley's school was only a short walk away, so she got there on her own. About halfway through the day, her mother got a call from the school, saying that Riley had missed some classes. This alarmed Chantel slightly, but she still didn't see it as a major concern. Her daughter could have just skipped a few classes and gone out with friends. At about 3.30 p.m., Riley's grandmother began to worry. The girl should have been home by now, but still wasn't. Then she contacted Chantel at which point her mother already suspected something was wrong. Riley was always calling or texting her to take time off to go out with friends after school, but that day she didn't get a single message from her daughter. Her mother had sent her several messages, and they had all failed to reach their destination. Then she tried calling her, but each time it went to voicemail. This indicated that Riley's phone was either dead or had been turned off for some reason. Chantel also called Riley's own father hoping that the girl might have gone to him. However, he too did not contact his daughter that day. The mother asked her grandmother to go to the school and look for Riley there. The grandmother went there, but she was unable to locate the girl. Another the teachers knew where she could be either. Around 5 p.m., Chantel decided to take a day off from work and drove to the school. But she couldn't find your daughter either. She spotted her boyfriend in the parking lot and asked if he had seen Riley. But Hayden stated that he had spent the day on an out-of-town trip and had not even contacted her. Together, they went around the school grounds looking in and around the building itself. But the girl was nowhere to be found. After a while, her mother decided to go home, hoping that Riley might have returned there. Alas, she was not there either. After waiting some more time, she decided to go to the police. By then, the girl's father had arrived in Berkeley Springs and went in search of his daughter. He drove around the small town asking people he met if they had seen Riley. With a population of just over 600, most of the residents knew each other. One of the local teenagers said he saw her walking down the street. Unfortunately, this information did nothing to help him find Riley, and investigators thought the boy was just mistaken. The police quickly began a search interviewing everyone the girl knew. None of her friends had seen Riley that day, nor had she shown up at school. At the same time, several teachers noted that she was present in their classes. This misled the tactives at first but it soon became clear. These teachers had simply failed to notice the girl's absence and flagged her down. From conversations with Riley's acquaintances, the police began to reconstruct the chronology of events. They found out that on the evening of May 7th, the girl was on the phone with her boyfriend until 10.30 p.m., and she answered her friend's messages on social media until midnight. 
what follows is something very strange. At 5.40 a.m., Riley called her boyfriend by video link, but he was asleep at the time and didn't answer. The detectives immediately suspected something was wrong. Why was Riley trying to contact him at such an early hour? The girl's mother assured her that Riley would never run away from home. She simply had no reason to, given that she was the eldest child in the family. Her mother treated her very gently, almost never forbade her to go out with friends or a boyfriend allowed her to go to her father's house in another town at any time and generally did not control her every move. The only thing was that Riley always informed her of her plans and asked permission. Considering that the girl only 15 years old at the time of her disappearance. She had no driver's license, so she also could not leave town on her own in a car. This once again indicated that the version of an escape seemed unlikely. Instead, the detectives considered kidnapping as a most likely theory. The same evening Riley's mother contacted law enforcement, they began a search for the girl. Police officers searched the school and the surrounding area and combed the town. They were quickly joined by community volunteers who cared about Riley. As is usually the case, these small-town residents thought nothing like this could happen to them. Soon, the police decided to search Riley's bedroom. And there, they found the first grisly piece of evidence. On a pillow and sheets, they found small bloodstains they sent the items immediately to a lab where experts ran a DNA test and determined that the blood belonged to Riley. At this point, everyone realized that something truly terrible had happened to the girl. If her family had hoped to the last that Riley had gone somewhere on her own initiative, after the discovery of the blood, those hopes were dashed. Here, it's worth clarifying why the mother didn't notice traces of blood when she examined her daughter's bedroom a few hours earlier. The bed was made, and it had not occurred to her to lift the blanket. This finding not only indicated that the girl had most likely been attacked. It had all happened in her house, and it was up to the police to figure out who might have done it. After the blood trail was discovered, the search escalated in the days that followed. More volunteers joined the police. Dozens of people also provided various equipment that might come in handy when surveying the area. At one point, detectives even had to ask the public to stop carrying the equipment because there was already an excess of it. In addition, the police repeatedly gave press conferences to get the story out to the general public. There is always a chance that someone might have noticed something strange hurt suspicious conversations or stumbled upon potential evidence. So it was important for the police to let everyone in the county know about Riley. After a while, the local police were joined by the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the state police. Together, they continued to search for the missing girl, but with no results. On May 15th, Law enforcement decided to bring in additional forces and organized a large-scale surge covering a wide area of many kilometers around the city. The next morning, they announced that they had managed to find Riley Crossman's body. It was about a 40-minute drive from Berkeley Springs near a country road near the top of a small mountain. The detectives knew immediately they were dealing with a murder, not an accident. It looked as if the unknown perpetrator was trying to hide the body as far away from prying eyes as possible. Medical examiners examined the body and confirmed that it was indeed Riley, but they couldn't determine the cause of death because of the extensive decomposition. It was very strange because it had been just over a week since the girl had disappeared. Apparently, the killer had done something to the body. Investigators noticed several other strange things. First, the girl was wearing only one shoe, and they could not find a second shoe anywhere nearby. Secondly, they concluded that the unknown perpetrator changed her clothes because they had information that the girl was supposed to be wearing leggings and a sweatshirt. While when they found her, she was wearing shorts. They also found traces of whitewash or plaster on her clothing. The police reclassified the case as a homicide, and now they had to find the perpetrator. They re-interviewed all of Riley's relatives and acquaintances and noticed something odd. The testimony of Andy McCauley, Chantel's roommate, did not match the story of another man Andy worked with at a construction site in nearby Hedgesville. 
He initially told police that on May 8th, Riley's birthday, he did not leave his workplace from morning until late afternoon. However, that same day around 10 a.m., his neighbor noticed a green Dodge pickup truck in front of their house. The neighbor knew that this car did not belong to either Andy or Chantel. Moreover, Andy's driver's license had been temporarily revoked. With all this in mind, the neighbor asked Chantel what this car was doing in front of their house, but the woman was unaware. After the hotel became aware of Riley's disappearance, the neighbor decided to share the observation with the police. Detectives questioned Andy again. They determined that the vehicle in question belonged to one of his co-workers, and the man had not driven it before. The owner of the pickup truck often picked Andy up in the mornings to drive him to work. Upon learning that, the police were aware of his movements that day. Andy changed his statement. He stated that he had actually taken the pickup truck and drove it to buy illegal substances to take with a co-worker at the construction site later in the day. Sometimes later, he changed his statement again and said that he went to his house to pick up the substances and then returned to work. All of this already looked very strange, but the detective said even more creepy discoveries waiting for them next. For starters, they talked to Riley's mother and asked her to recall if she had noticed any oddities in her roommate's behavior. Then she told them that on May 8th, the day her daughter disappeared, Andy had indeed been acting suspiciously. When he returned home that night, Chantel told him about Riley's disappearance. The man immediately said he would go looking for her, got on his bike, and rode off. However, when the woman returned home from her search, she found Andy asleep on the couch, as if nothing had happened. This behavior was very strange. All of Riley's relatives had been combing the streets until late at night, helped by concerned townspeople, while Andy simply went to sleep as if nothing had happened. In addition, one day after the girl went missing, Chantel called Andy and recorded the conversation. Unfortunately, its full content was not disclosed. All we know is that Chantel was already suspicious of Andy at this point and linked it all to his addiction to illegal substances. The police then spoke to Andy's co-worker and found out that, in fact, the men had been absent from work from about 9 a.m. until about 2 p.m. In addition, the co-worker stated that he believed that Andy had banned substances with him to begin with, so there was no reason for him to go somewhere to get them. Detectives then searched for the green dodge and found a large stain of dried plaster in the trunk. Forensics showed that it was the same substance found on Riley's clothing. Investigators also led service dogs to the pickup, which detected a deadly smell in the trunk. They also found some pretty specific bolts in the car, which are rarely used. Two of the exact same bolts were found near Riley's body. The police soon found another inconsistency in Andy's statement. They examined camera footage from nearby communities and found that on May 8th, the man was only a few miles from where Riley's body would later be found. He was caught on gas station store cameras and on several traffic cameras. It was all very strange. Andy didn't have a driver's license, was usually picked up by other people, and got around on his bike. But this day, for some reason, he took someone else's car and drove it around for half a day on unfamiliar routes. Another co-worker told police that on May 8th, Andy asked him for three construction bags. Detectives were also approached by Andy's former co-worker who told an even creepier story. He said that he and Andy had never got along, but between about 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on May 8th, Andy called him dozens of times and also sent a whole bunch of messages. He was in a panic and said he needed to hide with someone right away. And he explained that he was in possession of illegal substances and was afraid of being caught. This former colleague did not let him in that night but later reported the story to the police. In his defense, the man stated that he had taken illegal substances at night, after which he noticed a police car parked not far from his house and panicked. Except the police department checked this information and found that none of their cars were in that area. This meant that Andy's story was a common lie. All of the above was enough for the police to arrest Andy the day after the body was found and charged him with murder. The man denied guilt, 
so the case went to trial. The case then stalled for more than two years as the trial did not begin until September 27, 2021. This was due to the coronavirus and the limitations associated with it, as well as the peculiarities of the U.S. court system where such delays are the norm. Nevertheless, even more gruesome details of the case emerged during the course of the trial. For starters, Chantel, in her speech, provided one disturbing detail about the evening of May 7th. That afternoon, she returned from work at 10 p.m., and Andy was asleep on the couch when she entered the room. The man immediately woke up. When she saw his eyes, Chantel immediately thought he had taken illegal substances. Andy had used powerful drugs before and even had a criminal record for possession, of which the woman was well aware. Further, the prosecution revealed information about disturbing messages sent from Riley's phone shortly before her disappearance. At 11 p.m. on May 7, the girl texted her boyfriend that Andy had just gone into her room. Point 12 minutes later, she sent another text, where she wrote that she was scared. She never contacted him again. Unfortunately, Hayden had already gone to bed at that time and did not see these messages. By morning, they had already been deleted. At trial, he also said that Andy had repeatedly entered Riley's room that night. The girl was video chatting with her boyfriend, and Hayden could hear him enter the room. Andy asked her to do the dishes and talked about some other mundane things. But Riley was unequivocally afraid of him. She asked Guy not to pass out while Andy was in her room. It also came out at trial that Andy had called Riley several times around 3 a.m., but she wouldn't pick up the phone. And on the third time, she blocked his number altogether. The whole thing was very creepy and incomprehensible. According to the prosecution's version, Andy made these calls to see if Riley was communicating with her boyfriend at the time. Later, the records of these calls were deleted from both phones, but the cell phone provider still had them. Despite all this, the prosecution had no evidence to indicate what had happened that night. They speculated that Andy killed Riley late that night, waited until morning, and drove to work. He then borrowed a co-worker's car, drove to the house, picked up the body, and took it to a secluded spot. He then cleared the message and call history from her phone and got rid of it. It also emerged at trial that Chantel and Andy's own mother not only knew about his addiction to illegal substances but also knew that under their influence, the man was becoming aggressive and dangerous. The final court hearing was held on October 5, 2021. Despite the fact that all available evidence was circumstantial and did not connect Andy directly to the murder, the jury reached a guilty verdict. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Further consideration was given to the possibility of parole. Andy's attorneys asked to give their client the option after 15 years, but the judge ultimately ruled for life without the possibility of parole. As the judge pronounced the sentence, Andy showed no emotion. He also seemed detached and uninterested at previous hearings. Apparently, he had resigned himself to the inevitable. But what about motive? Because of the degree of decomposition, the experts could not establish whether Riley had been abused. This, however, is the most obvious option. Even though the court could not now prove it, this story was widely covered in the American media, and people's opinions were divided. Some put part of the blame on the girl's mother, who brought a convicted drug addict into her home and built a family with him. At the trial, she assured that it had never even occurred to her that Andy might harm her children. Others defended the mother, believing that she could not have foreseen such an outcome. She worked two jobs most of the time to feed her family, and perhaps she didn't even have time to think about how her decisions might affect her children. What remains unclear is the moment of that 5.30 a.m. video call made from Riley Hayden's phone. Was the girl still alive at that moment? Or did Andy make the call to throw off the investigation later? Do you think Chantel should be blamed for the situation? Tell us what you think. A 24-year-old girl disappeared from the store where she worked the evening shift. Police found traces of blood in the back room and signs of struggle, 
but it was definitely not a robbery. The unknown perpetrator had left a full cash register. A few days later, the girl's body was found five kilometers from the store. The investigation of this terrible case dragged on for nearly 25 years. It was not until a quarter of a century later that it became known what had happened to Lisa Siegert. Lisa Marie Seeger was born on March 24, 1968, in Holyoke, Massachusetts. She grew up in a close-knit family with three other children besides her. They lived in a town called Egome. From an early age, the girl loved music and learned to play several instruments. For a while, she was even a member of the school music group. After high school, Lisa went to Westfield State University, where she received her teaching degree in 1990. As an intern, she worked several shifts as a counselor at a children's camp and also taught Sunday school at her church. After that, she took a job as a teacher's aide at Agawam High School, where she had once studied herself. She spent most of her time working with a group of children with special needs. At the age of 24, she understood her students better than any other teacher. At the same time, she was very professional and tried to make sure each of her students got the best education possible. She also worked part-time at the local card and gift store in the evenings. On Wednesday, April 15, 1992, she finished her shift at school at about half past five and went to the store, where she was at work until 9 p.m. At about 5.30 p.m., her sister Lynn came into work with her briefly. According to her recollection, Lisa was in a good mood that evening and nothing foretold trouble. The next morning, saleswoman Sophia Maynard arrived at the store and was scheduled to begin her shift at 9 o'clock. To her surprise, Lisa's car was in the parking lot. It was strange because the girl worked at school in the mornings and was not supposed to be in the store in place of classes. There was a light on inside and a sign on the door that was open. Sophia thought that Lisa might have been out for the morning shift due to the approaching Easter. They were planning to inflate balloons for sale for that holiday. Sophia walked into the store and called Lisa by name, but there was no response. When she approached the counter, she saw her things there, including her wallet and car keys. It all looked very strange, so she decided to call the police. A squad arrived at the store and began their inspection. Everything looked normal in the main part of the premises, but there was a creepy opening in the back. The officers saw several crushed boxes with traces of blood on them. Later, they found several cards scattered on the floor, which also had blood on them. They also found a small dent in the door, which they thought might have been left by a heel strike. Despite all this, they were unable to find any useful leads on the store premises. It soon became known that Lisa had also failed to show up at school this morning. The principal even called her mother to ask if everything was okay, but her mother did not know where her daughter was either. The news of Lisa's disappearance quickly spread through the small town, and within hours, all of her friends, relatives, and acquaintances were on the case. The first thing the police did was to work up a theory of robbery, but that theory immediately fell away. No one had touched the money in Lisa's cash register or wallet. All the merchandise was also there. Subsequently, detectives began to reconstruct the chronology of events that evening. They learned that Lisa's sister had left the store at about 6 p.m. After talking to employees at neighboring stores, they obtained more information. At about 7.20 p.m., Lisa spoke with the owner of the carpet store next door. They discussed the pressing problem with the local parking lot, which was being occupied by bowling alley customers. The owner told her that he himself would not risk voicing his displeasure with the drivers who parked in front of their stores because many of them, he said, were crazy and dangerous. He and Lisa talked for about 15 minutes after which he went home. After examining the cash register, police determined that the last time money had been deposited into it was 8.20 p.m. Detectives also found a woman who entered the store around 9 past 5. The door was open, but the clerk never came out. The woman thought she heard some noise from the back room, but she decided to just leave. Thus, the police established the approximate window of Lisa's disappearance.
At 8.20 p.m., she served her last customer, and by 9 o'clock, something had happened to her. The detectives were to find out what had happened in those 40 minutes. The local investigators were assisted by the FBI and state police. Together, they organized a massive surge, foot squads combed the area surrounding the store, and several helicopters searched the more distant terrain. Police dogs were also brought to the store in the hope that could pick up Lisa's trail. Unfortunately, none of this yielded any results. Investigators understood that Lisa had clearly not left the store of her own free will. So on April 17th, the head of the local police announced a reclassification of the case. While it had previously been a missing person case, two days after her disappearance, the police were already investigating a kidnapping. On Sunday morning, April 19th, all local churches prayed for Lisa to be found alive and unharmed. It was Easter, but there was no holiday spirit at all. At about 2 p.m., the police received a call. A man was walking his dog on the outskirts of town near Highway 75. Walking along a wooded area, he noticed the woman's body and immediately contacted law enforcement. Officers arrived on the scene and identified Lisa Seeger. They found multiple wounds on her body from a sharp object. Later, medical experts determined that the girl had also been abused. Her body was about 5 kilometers from the store. This meant that the perpetrator most likely drove the girl here in a car. Detectives immediately cordoned off the area and moved in a single line so as not to compromise potential evidence. It was raining in those days and there were several tire tracks on the soaked road. Unfortunately, the police were unable to find the guns or any other tangible evidence. The news that Lisa was the victim of an unknown brutal killer quickly spread throughout the city. A farewell service was held at the church where the girl taught on Sundays. It was attended by nearly a thousand people. Residents of the small town accustomed to a quiet and safe life fell into a state close to panic. Many shopkeepers eliminated single shifts, and colleagues walked each other to their cars. The self-defense sections were overcrowded in a matter of days. In addition, about 300 women applied for permits to own firearms. The whole town feared that an unknown criminal might strike again. Meanwhile, the police and FBI were working on the case almost around the clock. Soon, it became known that they had managed to get a DNA sample from the crime scene that might belong to the killer. They worked out the theory that Lisa's boyfriend was involved, but he had an alibi and his DNA did not match the sample they found. Friends, co-workers, and relatives of the girl also had DNA testing done, and again, no matches. The police also received many tips from local residents. Some reported seeing a suspicious car on the night of Lisa's murder. Others ensured that they knew the name of the culprit, but all these leads led nowhere, and detectives sifted them out. From the tire tracks on the road near where the body was found, the police determined that they had been left by a van or a large SUV. Detectives questioned all drivers of similar vehicles, and again, were no closer to catching the perpetrator, but they were able to find a witness who may have seen the same vehicle. An employee of a store near where Lisa worked was driving home at about 9.15 at night. Standing at a traffic light, she saw a large SUV pulling off the road and heading toward the place where Lisa's body would later be found. The woman could not describe the car in more detail because it was dark outside. She only noted that she believed there was a man and a woman in the car. She added the odd fact that when the car pulled into the dirt road, the woman's head was twitching unnaturally as if she were asleep or unconscious. Alas, this information also did not help lead to the respect. Any leads have since come to an end. The police continued to work on the case, but with each passing month, hope of solving this macabre mystery faded. A year and a half passed before Lisa's family and friends were given a new chance to discover the truth. In October 1993, National television aired an episode devoted to the case. The popular program filmed stories about unsolved cases, which drew enormous attention to them. Sometimes this led to new witnesses for the police, and the case got a second wind. Lisa's case was no exception. 
Within an hour of the broadcast, the police received several hundred calls from people who had some kind of information. As is usually the case, most of these leads led nowhere, but the police worked through each and every one of them. According to the detective, they were able to identify a few valuable leads, but they did not specify which ones. Unfortunately, it also went nowhere. As the years went by, the chances of solving the case steadily declined. Lisa's family went to great lengths to ensure that her legacy was not forgotten. Although her teaching career was cut short early on, Lisa's relatives made a major contribution to the Agawam education system. In 1995, her parents donated $11,000 to the science division of the school where Lisa worked. These funds went to buy equipment and support genetics classes. The parents also set up a fund to help gifted students which distributed about $35,000 in awards. Ten years had passed since Lisa's murder. Her mother had not given up hope that the case would ever be solved. She went to great lengths to support the memory of her daughter. Her mother took part in every interview and answered reporters' questions. And every year, she gathered hundreds of people to honor Lisa's memory and light candles. Meanwhile, police had only one piece of significant evidence on their hands, a DNA sample from the alleged killer. They kept checking it against known criminal databases, hoping that the right person would get there sooner or later. But year after year, it didn't. In September 2016, 24 years after Lisa's murder, investigators decided to try a new method, DNA phenotyping. Its essence is the following. Based on the information embedded in a person's DNA, experts determine the features of his appearance and build an assumed portrait. At the moment, using DNA, specialists can find out the sex, approximate age, eye, and hair color. The portrait generated from this data is not always accurate, but sometimes the coincidence with the face of a real person is amazing. Based on the DNA of Lisa's alleged killer, experts presented two portraits of the suspect, age 25 and 50. When the police department published these portraits, they received more than 170 calls. These people reported seeing a similar man, but most of these leads also led nowhere. And only a year later, on September 18, 2017, police suddenly made a high-profile announcement. The perpetrator had been arrested. He turned out to be a 49-year-old man named Gary Shera. The news instantly went viral throughout the American media. A case in which the police find the killer after a quarter of a century is very rare. So such stories immediately attract a huge amount of public attention. Immediately after Shera's arrest, Investigators revealed how they had managed to track him down. It turned out that the man was considered a suspect back in 1993, a year after Lisa's murder. Remember that program on federal television, after which the police received hundreds of calls with potential leads? One of the callers was a lawyer from Seattle. He told detectives that his client might have information about Lisa's murder. She was a woman who was in the process of divorcing her husband. They lived in a town called Longmeadow, which was near Agawam. According to the woman, her husband was showing increased attention to Lisa Siegert's case. If this murder was on television, he would run into the room and stare blankly at the screen, totally unresponsive to those around him. As you may have realized, this man was Gary Shera. He was 24 years old at the time. He was in a very troubled marriage and had a one-year-old son. He and his wife were constantly fighting and had already begun divorce proceedings shortly after the birth of their child. According to the police statement, they had worked out the theory that Gary was involved back in 1993, but found no evidence to support it. On the contrary, his ex-wife, as a source of information, raised doubts. The fact is she had a whole list of mental disorders as well as a long history of alcohol abuse. Moreover, during the divorce, Gary obtained custody of their son through the courts, but his wife secretly removed the child to another state. Another important fact to add here, this was by no means the first time that former or current wives had called the police saying that their husbands might be involved in Lisa's murder. 
Surprisingly, there were indeed many such calls, so the detectives thought that Gary's case was just one of those. Even so, they questioned him, but the man denied his involvement and refused to give a DNA sample. No one could legally force him to give a sample, so the police essentially had no other options. Later, detectives compiled a list of all the men questioned in the case who refused to give a DNA sample. Gary was among them, and the police called him in for questioning several more times. During the third interview in 2008, it was apparent that Gary was trying not to touch anything. Not even the table. He was offered a bottle of water, but he refused. He looked as if he had only one thing on his mind, how the cops wouldn't get his DNA sample. By 2017, detectives had a list of 11 suspects on their hands, including Gary. All of them had been interviewed at various stages of the investigation and refused to voluntarily submit to DNA testing. In fact, there were many more suspects on that list. But through DNA phenotyping, investigators were able to weed out unsuitable candidates. They did not match some of the characteristics that experts determined from the DNA sample of Lisa's killer. In August 2017, detectives gathered all available information and went to court. They asked for an order compelling all the list members to provide DNA samples, and the court agreed. On September 13th of that same year, police went to Gary's apartment to notify him of this obligation, but the man was not home. The door was opened by his neighbor with whom they shared an apartment. The detectives left him their business card and asked him to give the information to Gary urgently. The very next day something unexpected happened. Gary's current girlfriend came to the police station and reported that he had left three letters in her apartment. To the researcher's surprise, among them was an apology to the Seeger family and a detailed confession of Lisa's murder on two sheets. Gary wrote that he had had violent and uncontrollable desires in him since childhood. He was obsessed with thoughts of kidnapping and abuse. That evening, as he drove past Lisa, Gary, as he himself articulated in a letter, allowed himself to do something horrible. The man specified that he did not plan to kill Lisa, but events allegedly got out of his control. Gary wrote that he wanted to surrender to the police hundreds of times but could not do so because of cowardice. He stated that he had lived with self-loathing all these years. At the end of the letter, he stated that he planned to end his life. Police immediately began searching for Gary, and soon his car was spotted in the parking lot of a hospital in Stafford Springs. There was another suicide note on the windshield. It turned out that the man had ingested some powerful drugs but got in his car immediately afterward and rushed to the nearest hospital where he was pumped out. As soon as the doctors were finished helping him, the police arrested Gary and took him to the station. At the same time, a judge issued a search warrant for his apartment as well as his girlfriend's apartment. There, the police saw several objects containing his DNA. The result of the analysis surprised no one a complete match with the sample of the killer. Along with that, detectives unearthed several other potentially significant leads. Gary's wife, who had reported suspicions about him back in 1993, passed away in 2014. However, investigators were able to find documents drafted by her lawyer where the woman revealed many gruesome details. One day, Gary told her in plain language that he could not engage in intimacy with her unless he had a knife in his hand. The day after Lisa's murder, the woman called her sister and told her that Gary had come home late at night, was extremely disturbed, and his body was covered with scratches. He also gave his wife a music box and said that he had bought it at the very store where Lisa worked. Except, according to Gary himself, it was an older woman with gray hair who sold it to him. The problem is that no such employee has ever been there. It is not clear why all these details were not reported to the police in 1993, and it is impossible to find out now. While in custody, Gary suddenly proclaimed his innocence and refused to confess to what he had done. In all likelihood, he was driven by simple fear. But with that kind of evidence... There was no chance of getting away with it. 
The only thing he was able to achieve was a postponement of his sentence. The trial was not to begin until two years later, but Gary, who had been in a cell the whole time, suddenly decided to plead guilty. On September 21, 2019, he appeared before a judge and pleaded guilty to the murder of Lisa Siegert. This charge qualified as first-degree murder, and in Massachusetts, a defendant on such a sentence faces life in prison without parole. Lisa's family was present in the courtroom. Her mother, who had hoped for 25 years to learn the truth, spoke. She thanked everyone involved in the investigation as well as the ordinary concerned people who had supported her family all this time. As a result, the killer went to live out the rest of his life behind bars. One of the state's longest-running criminal cases was officially closed. Despite the fact that it took a quarter of a century, the bitter truth in such a case is anything better than endless ignorance. If you enjoyed, like this video and subscribe on Cover Eyes.